Hey everyone, we're back for another episode of Ask GN, and we have a couple quick questions this week and then some more in-depth ones that require actually separate videos altogether. So first off, question from Eli. Do you have high hopes for AMD Zen? Do you also agree on it making or breaking it? I assume it referring to AMD as a company or at least their CPU division. Uh, high hopes. So no, as a rule, I generally don't develop hopes for any of these architectures because it's really our job to analyze them based on their merits and performance, not based on what we hope they will be. So I try not to develop any hopes for them. I really have no personal opinions of Zen right now. I've read about it. Obviously, we know some stuff about it, but that's all on the objective side and will be used for review content. So I would say I don't really have any type of hopes for Zen. Now, AMD as a company would have pretty high hopes for it because addressing the second half of the question, do you agree on it making or breaking AMD? Uh, yes, it sort of does make or break their CPU division because FX, that lineup, is built on AM3 Plus platforms, which is from 2011. AM3 is the basis of AM3 Plus. That's from 2009. That is ancient in computer terms. That's archaic. And so moving forward, it's pretty important. AM4, AM4 looks really good. FM2, FM2 Plus, much better platforms than AM3. So AMD is going in the right direction. And Zen will at least hopefully achieve parity with Intel. That would be the, the one hope that I do have is that they achieve parity because FX is a bit behind in several ways. But uh, as far as it making or breaking the company, AMD is doing pretty well with GPUs right now. They really have a good opportunity to catch up a bit with NVIDIA. And I, I say that meaning market share. It's just sort of irrefutable at this point that NVIDIA does have a massive amount of the gaming market. So this sort of window between Polaris and Pascal for both architectures gives AMD a bit of an opportunity to strike, especially with their current asynchronous advantage in some games. Now with the, uh, again on the GPU side, the silicon manufacturing is being done by Samsung. They're getting kind of bailed out by Samsung. This is good news for AMD. And then Zen, we'll see how that goes, but that will definitely be a pretty important launch for them. I don't personally really have any hopes for it though, other than achieving parity or better would ideally be what happens because otherwise it's just, there's no point in releasing it. So the next question is from Drake Owens and Drake asks, Break out the crystal ball and tell me what you think will happen with the monitor scene in the next couple of years. I have a 1080p 144Hz display. I wonder what OLED, 4K, HDR, and quantum dot tech mean to me as a gamer when I want to upgrade. So monitors are interesting. It's not really a device you upgrade to regularly. At least I, I never have. It's always been you get a monitor and then you just use it until it breaks or until it's so obsolete that it, you have to upgrade. Uh, so 4K, I will say this first. 4K really doesn't interest me. I don't think it's going to take off like uh, maybe the market expected it would. But 1440p is pretty interesting. So on the gaming side, 1440p is a good middle ground resolution. Uh, it often allows or comes with high refresh rates, which is much more interesting to me as a gamer than a lot of other monitor display techs. So if you get 120, 144 hertz at 1440p, you're in a pretty damn good spot. And that's great for FPS games and things like that. Uh, 4K, there's not a huge advantage to it. Maybe if you're a really cinematic type gamer and you can see that pixel difference. But other than that, I'm most interested in ultra wides. So like that Acer Predator we looked at, which was 30, 440 by 1440. That's a pretty cool display, not just the Predator, but in general, that resolution, the ultra wide 21 by nine setup. That's it's really good for production. It's basically two displays on your desktop that takes one physical slot on the desk itself. So it's really easy to work with. I, I think ultra wides are worth paying attention to. HDR is the next thing worth paying attention to. I don't know how far it will go for gaming, but there's some stuff that developers have to do to really utilize it. It's not a lot of work though. And then HDR, high dynamic range for those who don't know, basically just means you get more bit depth for the, the colors. So the colors are more clear, you get better blacks instead of the fuzzy black that's produced with the sort of grainy output of TN 8-bit displays. And then uh, certain other colors, blue spectrum, are going to be sharper as well with the HDR displays. So it's it's cool to look at. It's certainly sharper. Uh, it depends sort of on the cost of the tech, how far it goes. That's the problem with 4K. It costs so much, or at least it did originally, that no one's really picked it up to a, a mass scale. So uh, again, I would say immediate future, 4, 1440p with high refresh rate. That's the one I would look at in the immediate future. 
ultra wides would look at in the immediate future and then uh, looking out a couple years from now see where HDR goes and if it sticks around because that would be sort of almost more interesting to me than 4k or something like that. The next question is from Doug who asks do you think thermal throttling is becoming a bigger problem with the new high-end laptops and desktops having desktop CPUs and GPUs in them. So for high-end laptops with the desktop GPUs and CPUs, the GTX 980 and laptops is probably the first real example of that recently. And we did see some thermal generation. It definitely got hot, but it wasn't really throttling too hard. So the GTX 980 as an example, just because that is the one that's in desktops right now and also in laptops, the 980, is a, a device, a GPU that throttles at around 80 Celsius. So once you start hitting 80 Celsius, the clock rate will throttle itself and go up and down according to the heat. And so it'll drop and that'll drop your thermal levels and then it'll jump up again once the heat has gotten under control. So that's an example of how it throttles. Now, whether it throttles depends on the laptop and the thermal design of the laptop, the heat pipe design, heat sink design, the fans, all of that, your fan curve in the sort of at, at a minimum you run a higher fan speed to keep those devices under hopefully the 80 celsius range absolute value but whether it actually is uh, is a problem i guess just depends on the unit so the msi gt72 dominator pro g we looked at ran a little warm but not so much that it was really throttling noticeably other units especially if you sort of step down from the massive behemoth size of the gt72 those would have an issue with throttling, certainly. Next question is from Valguspoise, who says, how many FPS are used rendering desktop? How is rendering desktop different from rendering a game? Things can move on the desktop too, cursors, icons, notifications, and so on, just with not so many effects as in games. So yeah, that's of course true. It's not a lot of effects on the desktop, and that's by design. They want it to be as sort of functional as possible without requiring resources to just draw windows. Uh, so that's correct. But how much, how many frames per second to do it? If you run something like Fraps and just force it to run on the desktop, you'll see that it just constantly pushes the, the refresh rate of the monitor. So if your refresh rate is 60, your desktop will render at about 60 FPS unless there's a problem. And the same is true for 120 Hertz or 144 Hertz. The desktop will match whatever your display is. There's no real such thing as VSync for just a desktop. There's no reason you'd want 3000 FPS for your desktop. So uh, keeping it locked to the refresh rate is actually a good thing here because if you start just unleashing the GPU fully, one, it'll require more power than really is necessary just to render a desktop. And two, you start running into coil wine issues with some of the AMD and NVIDIA cards where the uh, the GTX 960 comes to mind. Some of them have some coil wine issues when they start pushing more than a thousand FPS, which would definitely happen on a desktop. Next question is from Guillermo Perez, who says, oh, this one's actually, this is a pretty long question. So uh, I have a few questions bugging me. What is the purpose of pushing the and marketing the GPU inside of the i7 series since i7 is aimed at high-end users who would want it when they're just getting a DGPU anyway. So let's let's just focus on that question for today, uh, or for now anyway. The, the reason the IGP is being pushed is because it's not so simple. Let me see, do you ask this? Uh, would it be better to not just use that die space for additional cores? So yes, you do ask that. So using the die space for additional cores is what they do with the X99 series right now, the extreme series of CPUs, and that will persist through Intel's next generation with Broadwell E. and there's a few reasons for it. One is marketing and segmenting the market to buy what they want them to buy. Uh, but the main reason is it's really not so easy to just take an existing architecture and by not so easy, I mean effectively impossible, take an existing architecture and then just say, not only are we gonna turn off the IGP part of this, but we're gonna put other CPU cores in there. It doesn't really work like that. Uh, AMD is a good example. They sell the 880K, the eight, all those Athlon X4 CPUs. Those are APUs but they turn the IGP off. So you're actually just sort of disabling half of the die and then selling a cheaper product. So they do that with those. Intel sort of did that with some of their previous, the G3258, but uh, there's not really such a thing as disabling the IGP on an i7 and then putting more cores in there. That's not really how it works. The Xeon series does 
disable that IGP and it lowers the cost a bit. But if you want to use the die space for more CPU cores, you really have to go into the Extreme series for Intel or the FX series for AMD because anything short of that is either a disabled IGP where you're just scrapping that whole die space and you're saving a bit of money or it is, uh, it's, it's just all CPU space depending on what you're looking at. Next question is from Ill2Xbox. This is actually a, a big question that I want to do a full proper feature on at some point, so we're only going to address a little bit here. But it's about CPU architecture, and he, sa he or she says, Hey, Steve, we've all hit a wall with CPU performance since Intel improves their performance by only a couple percent per generation, and people using San Sandy Bridge from five years ago <laughs> still use them, and they're still plenty fast enough. I agree with that. Do you think Intel and AMD should be focusing to improve their CPU performance? Or, or what, what do you think they should be focusing on? Uh, so there's a couple things here. One, definitely power. Power draw needs to go down. It's been going down. It needs to keep going down. That's a big market. Uh, it, it's weird in the market in terms of pushing the products because with the improved power draw, lower power draw means generally performance doesn't increase as much. And that's hard to advertise as a good thing. So you, you do see some kind of interesting battles there between AMD and Intel with talking about that. But I, that's where I think it's still the most important. You see this move to 10 nanometer from Intel. AMD is dropping their fab process as well. That will improve power draw a lot, cram more transistors in, and improving power draw is good for mobile devices, which are really driving the market right now, whether or not we want it to be that way. And mobile devices, they'll get more battery life and so forth. So that's a good thing for improving CPU architectures on the whole. Improving it on the desktop side, uh, caching, you want more cache, that's a big limiter. One really interesting thing to think about is HBM. So in the future, this is already happening with the Xeon Phi CPUs, basically scientific CPUs. But in the future, we're gonna start seeing this move where CPUs will incorporate HBM, just like GPUs, on uh, an interposer or something like that on top of the substrate. And as they do that, system memory becomes a lot less relevant to the average user. So I, I would imagine a point within the next five to 10 years where you might have mainstream rigs that just run HBM, maybe two or four gigabytes of it, well, pr probably four realistically, probably four gigabytes or more, four, eight, 16, whatever, that's all HBM2 is, uh, is pushing towards. But they'll be improving these architectures primarily by integrating memory and either getting rid of system memory for mainstream rigs or just minimizing its impact. So that's something really interesting to pay attention to. And I think that's where sort of the future of CPUs is and in, in the immediate uh, vantage point. And then IGP is really important as well for the same reason and for a couple of other reasons that we'll talk about in future videos. Last question, Leo DS says, oh, come on, no hair questions. Here's one. Why don't you grow a beard to go with the hair? That would look savage. Uh, it would just be unfair, frankly, to all the other YouTube channels. So, uh, I mean, you know, got to compete fairly. So that is all for this week. Check the Patreon link. The post video helps out directly. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.